Kingdom of Heaven, Ridley Scott's big-budget film set during the Crusades. But is this movie historically accurate? Find out today on Real Crusades History as we dissect Kingdom of Heaven and determine what in it is truly reflective of history and what is pure fiction. Hi, welcome back to Real Crusades History for part four in our ongoing series reviewing the movie Kingdom of Heaven. I'm Jay Stephen Roberts, and in this series, I'm joined by historians Dr. Helena Schroeder and Paul Copenhagen as we determine what is historically accurate in Kingdom of Heaven and what isn't. Helena, hello and welcome back. Thanks for being here. As always, I'm glad to be here. Great. And Paul, glad to have you with us as well. Welcome. Happy to be back in the saddle. Let's get right to this. When we last left off, Balian of Ibelin was with his knights mounted in a line before Karak Castle, waiting to meet Saladin's advance guard. As we hinted at last time, this is a weird scene because Balian, without any infantry, with a handful of horsemen, intends to hold this large Saracen force. Balian and his men basically go charging straight at this larger force of horsemen head on. This is suicidal behavior that an actual knight would have never attempted. What's even weirder, though, is the response of the Muslims and that they just charge right at Balian's men, which is also rather suicidal. The sensible thing for this Muslim cavalry to do would be to open a space for this handful of insane knights to pass through, let them tire their horses out, then pepper them with arrows. But, of course, these Muslims, bizarrely, have no archers with them. So basically what we get is two lines of horsemen just slamming into each other at full speed ensuring that everyone loses plenty of valuable men and horses. For some reason, this seems to be a common theme in movies these days, that the way medieval cavalry fought was by charging at one another full speed so that everyone just smashes their brains out. Helena, Paul, talk to me about what's wrong here. I think the confusion comes from the fact that a charge of heavy horse, which is what medieval, medieval chivalry was, could be a very effective um, and even decisive if it was employed at the right place and time. So medieval history, or rather early medieval history, is full of examples where a charge of knights decided the battle. I could cite several examples from the history of the Crusader states, and I'm sure Paul knows even more about this. However, you are right to point out, Steve, that the Saracens had rapidly learned to fear these charges because they were so effective, and so it developed tactics to counter them. One such tactic was to simply step aside, let the knights through, and then attack them after their momentum was spent. This is most famously done at the Battle of Hattin, where Tripoli's charge successfully broke through the Harrison encirclement, but the Christian infantry was not able to exploit the breakthrough and escape before the Saracens had closed the lines again. Of course, another tactic which was very popular among Saracens was to pretend to flee in panic and then lure the Christian knights into an ambush, or at least until their formation had disintegrated and the horses were winded. But the crash of charging horses makes really great cinematography. <laughs> That's why I think it's popular in a lot of movies. Absolutely. The cavalry charge is precisely what many nations relied upon in the middle, medieval era to be that sort of final push that would lead to a break in the line and the eventual rout of the enemy army. You know, we hear of it plenty of times, but the fact is most, most of the startling battles that we recall from the medieval period are the times when the heavy cavalry charge doesn't work for one, one reason or another, such as at Agincourt, Cressy, or at Stirling Bridge. Uh, this is usually in relation to some sort of various complications over terrain or tactical problems which nullified the effectiveness of the cavalry. This is absolute suicide. With a perfectly defensible fortification behind him, there's no reason other than for the cinematic wow factor to charge into that overwhelming Saracen force. Except, and I'm going to say this in, in Scott's defense, that the idea here is not that they weren't going to defend the fortress, but rather that all these unarmed civilians were rushing to get into the fortress and that Balian is supposed to be charging to protect them. So I'm going to, with all the caveats we've said about this being ridiculous with no archers in the, on the Saracen side, etc., I think that in terms of the plot of the movie, it's the idea of Saracen, of Balian trying to help the unarmed and sacrificing himself for those who couldn't fight, which is a fundamental aspect of chivalry, because that's what knights were supposed to do. They were supposed to defend the unarmed, primarily churchmen, women, and peasants. So after Balian and his men predictably lose all of their horses and end up fighting on foot, hand to hand, broken up and isolated from one another against a horde of Saracens, they are all captured. 
and it's revealed that the man leading this Saracen advance guard is Imad Adin, Balian's buddy from earlier in the film. Imad, after having almost flattened Balian and all his men with his cavalry, resumes his friendly attitude with Balian and tells him he and all his men can be on their way and just mosey on into Karak. Again, just a really weird scene that feels very unrealistic. There is an important medieval element once again missing. Ransom. I don't want to belabor this point, but I think that Imad would definitely require Balian and his men to pay some kind of large ransom toward their release. Absolutely. Although it's quite realistic to show the horses rather than the men getting killed, Frankish armor of this period did provide very good protection against the weapons of the Saracens, but horses were not yet armored, and so, or only partially so. Knowing that it was difficult to outright kill the Frankish knights, that encouraged the Saracens to concentrate on bringing down their horses, and in so doing, they often indirectly caused the death of the knights, as men broke their necks, etc., when being tossed off a horse at high speed. Or even if they survived the fall, they were then likely to get trampled to death by all the other horses in the fight, or they could more easily be set aside by multiple Saracens at once and their advantage of the armor nullified. What's not correct, and although not shown in this film, is often so often referenced in literature that I feel compelled to say something about it, is that a knight could not remount if on horse. Knights were trained in their armor, and heavy as it seems to us, they were, unless injured or aged, quite capable of springing back into the saddle. Um, I should point out that horses of the period were also much smaller than they are today. Even if they got on horse, they were not necessarily killed, is what I'm trying to say. There's absolutely no reason they wouldn't ransom Balian, you know, especially the historical Balian. Even the fictionalized, freshly minted nobleman was worth a little something, but the historical Balian would have fetched a pretty florin or ducat or denier. Uh, ransom was, if you will, a sort of way to make the captive who just got captured by your forces pay for the trouble and damage they caused. This is how the medieval economy works. Troops are raised and deployed with coin, often borrowed from various sources. Replacing armor, trained horses, broken weapons, and other materiel of war costs money. And the most expedient way was to extort it from the enemy via ransom, which not only allowed you to recuperate your funds, but also limited their ability to make war to some extent by depriving them of the lifeblood of the army, which is money. Okay. I don't want to take us off track or anything, but... I wanted to kind of ask you to, um, in terms of horses being armored, I mean, I know they weren't armored as much as they were later at this period, but would they have been protected in some way at this point? I mean, even if it wasn't with armor, would they have been wearing like a quilted type thing or something? I don't know. Paul, what do you think? Yeah, I, I think that there would have been some sort of protection. Um, the medieval war horse was often very heavily trained. I mean, they had to, they had to certainly survive uh, conditions that other horses would just break and panic. So there's certainly some level of protection, but I don't think at this point in time uh, in the 12th century that we're seeing any sort of heavier barding armor other than maybe a quilted uh, pattern across the horse. And even then, you're really only going to find that with the most noble knights because you also have to remember the horses get very, very hot very, very quickly. Hmm. And an overheated horse is just going to literally fall over and collapse. So I, yeah. you definitely have to watch out for that. Hmm. You know, they were extremely expensive. A, war horse, a knight's war horse cost at least as much as the armor normally more. They were very, very valuable. So a knight would want to try to protect them. But exactly what Paul's saying, the trade-off is if you put chain mail on a horse, it makes it's very, very heavy. And it makes it even harder for them to, to, mo to be mobile and for them to get up to speed. And, and, and it also is very, very hot because chain mail, of course, in this kind, in the weather conditions in Ultramar specifically, is extremely hot. So the, the, as far as I know, the only protection the horses had at this time was cloth. It could have been quilted, but that, as you say, would have been hotter. Um, but there was some protection simply in having flowing robes. The trappers, because arrows often got stuck in that actually loose flowing uh, material and didn't go through, but it, they also could go through. I mean, it was it was it was a clearly a very very difficult trade off for a knight to try to decide whether he wanted to weigh down his horse with some kind of quilted protection that then made it hot and less um, detracted from his speed, or to go towards you know less armor that made him even more vulnerable. Yeah, that's interesting. The Turkish archers actually 
I guess they used smaller types of bows where the arrows were maybe not as heavy. And yeah. so they might not have been necessarily as effective against a cavalry like that. But okay, so let's get back to our movie here. Uh, yeah, the next scene actually is pretty cool, uh, especially visually. Imad Adin, he's standing there talking to Bailey, and he looks back and notices that Saladin's main army is approaching. But then as he turns back toward Balian, he sees the Kingdom of Jerusalem's army, led by Baldwin IV, kind of fading into view. It's kind of an interesting visual scene. What I've always been curious about is the way Baldwin's army is moving here in this scene, almost in a giant horde of men. The numbers definitely seem too big. Virtually no medieval army was as large as what we're seeing here, which just looks absolutely huge. And Saladin's army looks too large as well. Uh, Helena, Paul, what do you think about the way they are marching? Is this accurate? The Kingdom of Jerusalem could muster between twenty and 30,000 men, of which only about 1,000 were secular knights and another 500 to 600 were knights of the militant orders. Then there would have been roughly 5,000 light cavalry composed of native volunteers from the non-Latin Christian population and maybe 1,000 to 1,200 sergeants from the militant orders. So roughly 8,000 cavalry and three times as many infantry, including archers. The Saladin, because he could draw on the forces of both Egypt and Syria, could muster more, uh, much larger forces than the Crusader kingdoms could, but I don't actually have clear numbers here. Paul, what do you know? As before, this is Hollywood trying to treat the ex historical exaggeration literally. Uh, the medieval army just didn't have the support necessary to reach the numbers we're seeing on screen. Centuries later in the development of the professional army, we don't even see these sorts of numbers. To put it in context, at the pivotal Battle of Waterloo in 1815, we see maybe 140,000 troops combined, both between the coalition and the French troops. So your numbers are spot on. Uh, we just don't see that mechanism of state centralization and taxation, the robust middle class feeding the tax engine of the state, or the standardization of equipment that even lowers the costs to make those numbers feasible. And we won't see that until the Industrial Revolution hits its stride. How should we forget the entire population of the Kingdom of Jerusalem at this time? Men, women, children, Orthodox, Latins, Muslims, and Jews was just 600,000. So the next scene I've also always found rather visually appealing. Baldwin IV of Jerusalem goes out to try and reach terms with Saladin, Basically, the two of them meet alone, right there in between their two armies. This seems rather fanciful. My guess is they would have simply sent messengers back and forth, but maybe not. I suppose it's conceivable that they would have met in person, though probably not like this. A couple of things that are definitely not accurate. Baldwin gets Saladin to agree to withdraw his army by promising that Reynald will be punished, implying again that Saladin's reason for attacking Karak was merely out of vengeance for Reynald's crimes against Muslim civilians. And two, Saladin tells Baldwin he will, quote, send him his physicians. Now, we know this isn't accurate. There is no record of Saladin sending physicians to Baldwin IV, although I believe there is a story from the Third Crusade in which Saladin sent a physician to Richard the Lionheart. Correct. And because we know Saladin did send his physician to Richard, I rather like him making the gesture here. Art is often about condensing facts for the sake of dramatic effect and to maintain the viewer's reader's interest. So for the same reason, I don't think, I don't mind the leaders facing face, meeting face to face here. In fact, there's probably good precedent that Balian met face to face with Saladin, uh, as we'll see later in the film. A couple of relevant facts though. Saladin did lay siege to Karak a total of three times, twice before Hatim and once after. He did it because he saw Karak itself and Chatignon as a commander as a serious threat to his flank and his lines of communication. He wanted to eliminate both. The first two times he besieged Karak, the army of Jerusalem, led in both instances by Baldwin IV in a litter because he could no longer ride, broke the siege. Both times, Saladin withdrew before the approach of the feudal army of Jerusalem without even trying to fight. And that's quite a statement of respect for both the fighting capabilities of the Franks and the leadership of the leper king. Two, on two occasions when Chatignon attacked convoys during a truce, Saladin went through the motions of first demanding Chatignon's punishment, and then, when nothing happened, launching an evasion. The second time he did this was the campaign that led to Hatim. So modern historians would argue that Saladin, having de declared jihad, didn't really need an excuse, and sometimes he didn't bother with him. But every political leader, 
then as now, likes to portray himself as being engaged in a just war, and it's always useful to rally support by pointing to some despicable act committed by your enemy. You know, they remember the Alamo and remember the main kind of stuff. So what I'm saying is that Scott has a basis in fact here. Saladin did ask the king of Jerusalem to punish Chatillon for various violations of the truce. And by implication, he might have withdrawn if he'd been given satisfaction. The fact that such a withdrawal might only have been tactical or temporary is beside the point. Uh, next, we get the scene in which King Baldwin goes to meet Reynald of Chatillon in Kerak. Baldwin makes Reynald kneel before him, then beats him across the head with this riding crop as punishment for being mean to Muslims. After this, Tiberius has Reynald arrested and thrown into prison. Now, obviously, this never happened, and in fact, Helena, as you explained to me once before, it's likely that Baldwin IV actually was very much in favor of Reynald's raids against Saladin. Would you like to elaborate on that, please? It's a little bit what we were talking about in the last episode, and that is that some, though not all, of Chatillon's raids were strategically beneficial to the Kingdom of Jerusalem. Most especially, the launching of a fleet of warships in the Red Sea, um, Professor Hamilton argues very, very effectively, was beyond the financial means of the barony of Transjordan, was almost certainly supported clandestinely by the crown. Transjordan, we have to remember, it was a bar barony which between the Sinai Desert and the Dead Sea. That's not a region where you find a lot of shipwrights and sailors. So the technical expertise had to have come from the coastal cities of the kingdom, notably from the large communities of Pisa, Venetians, and Genoese. I'd also like to point out that the inspiration for this scene is probably historical. After Chatillon had raided the Byzantine island of Cyprus, raping, pillaging, and burning, as we mentioned earlier in, the, in, our, in our, one of our earlier episodes, the Byzantine emperor called up his army and advanced on Antioch, where Chatillon was then prince. Chatillon, being a man with acute understanding of military science, rapidly recognized that he didn't stand a ghost of a chance fighting the might of the Byzantine Empire. So he capitulated. He rushed out to meet the emperor and had himself led into his presence, walking barefoot and dressed in only a wool shirt with a noose around his neck, to symbolize his abject submission to the emperor's will. According to William of Tyre, who was then um, the uh, chancellor of the kingdom of Jerusalem, he flung himself at the emperor's feet and lay prostrate until, and I quote, um, William of Tyre, until all were disgraced and the glory of the Latins was turned into shame. Tyre concludes, Chatillon was a man of violent impulses, both in sinning and in repenting. So they say this scene when you have Chatillon groveling before Baldwin IV is quite legitimate in that Scott places it in the context of the film since it would have been quite impossible to include the incident from a decade earlier. All right, right before Tiberius departs, he says Hayabina, which apparently is Arabic for something like let's go. Now, Scott shows the Crusaders using Arabic here and there, and there's definitely some accuracy in that. We know that some Crusaders did learn Arabic. Um, I think actually uh, Raymond III of Tripoli may have been fluent in Arabic. Helena, Paul, how widespread do you think fluency in Arabic was among the Latins of Outremer? I guess that's how you, how you define fluency. What we would nowadays call survival Arabic was fairly widespread. This is a rudimentary, not necessarily grammatical, command of the language sufficient to make yourself understood in standard situations. This is because the peasant class of the Crusader states was predominantly Muslim, and so lords needed to be able to communicate, to give commands, and ask for fundamental, uh, ask fundamental questions in Arabic, etc. I think even more important, the native Christian populations had adopted Arabic as their means of communication over the 400 years of Arab domination. So transactions in markets, shops, inns, etc., would have been predominantly conducted in Arabic. What was rare, however, were people who could speak, you know, much less read, educated literary Arabic, or conduct sophisticated philosophical or diplomatic dialogue in Arabic. However, as you pointed out, we know for a fact that um, Raymond of Tripoli spoke Arabic, Sidon, um, the Baron of Sidon, spoke Arabic, and possibly the Edelin himself. Yeah, it goes back to when in Rome do as the Romans. Uh, Tiberius in this would have been fluent in this survival Arabic or military Arabic, even if this character didn't know any conversational Arabic, uh, although there's certainly historical evidence to say he did. Um, you know, such as, the, such as might be the case with a freshly arrived crusader, we're talking about the simple clipped commands. I'd be surprised if the average crusader, state soldier, or knight didn't have that sort of common uh, command of the language. 
add in the numbers of merchants and skilled tradesmen and craftsmen coming into the region, and the functional literacy of the marketplace is going to diffuse across the European population. Interesting. Okay, so the next scene, we are taken to Saladin's encampment, where the great sultan of Egypt is confronted by an imam who's angry over the fact that they didn't attack the Christians, but instead withdrew. Now, once again, this is sort of Scott showing that religion itself is the problem. In this case, a Muslim cleric, for lack of a better term, is encouraging Saladin to use violence, but the wise Saladin sort of mocks this and even makes some statements that imply that he too is kind of a religious skeptic. The Imam says, quote, the results of battles are determined by God alone. And Saladin says, well, they are also determined by numbers, the availability of water and the absence of disease. And uh, then there's a part where Saladin asks this Imam, uh, how many battles did God win for the Muslims before I came? And the Imam says, few enough, but that was because we were sinful. And then Saladin says, it was because you were unprepared. Okay, now one notable difference, I think, in the way Scott portrays this Islamic religious man versus the Christian priests shown earlier, this imam is given at least a dignified presentation. He's clean and hygienic for one thing, and his face isn't frozen in a perpetual sneer. We almost get the sense that this Muslim imam, while misguided, has sort of been forced into this violent attitude by the vile actions of the Christians. When he looks at Saladin and says, with a sad look on his face, you promised to return Jerusalem. Don't forget that. Steve, I agree with you that the portrayal of the Christian uh, priests, as you say, and portrayed the Templars, is really it's so yeah, farcical and, and insulting. But I think you may still be reading a little bit more into this scene than is, is necessary. I think the real point that we're trying to make is that there were fanatical Muslims in this period, and they were demanding, you know, even more religious fervor from their often very secularized and tactically astute leaders who didn't always want to press for, you know, ultimate destruction of the Christians because they often allied with them. Um, so, you know, you may be you may be seeing more in this than is intended. Yeah, on the one hand, we have that very clear demand from the imam commanding more religious fervor from his political leader. Uh, but I somewhat agree with Steve's presentation here. While we have our one-man Templar chorus saying God wills it whenever they talk about attacking the Muslim armies, and as we see in the future of the film, he says it basically whenever any military action is suggested. Uh, but contrary to this, what I'd like to point out is that the clergy— while being educated in terms of doctrine, the scriptures, sometimes in canon law and all the rest, would have been men of the world in a particular sense. These were men who studied what passed for history. These were men who knew how campaigns were fought precisely because they were often called to bless such campaigns. Uh, so the average imam and the average priest may very well have experienced warfare up close and personal. God was a factor, of course, but they both knew the realities of battle. Right. I would agree with that. Okay, so after the imam leaves, Saladin complains to his lieutenant, Imad ad-Din, that he's being pressured into a war with the Christians by his own people. What he says is, if I do not give war, I have no peace. Now, of course, we know this is historically inaccurate, since Saladin was in no way a man of peace. He was a vigilant, relentless warrior who was constantly on the campaign trail, usually against other Muslims. Although most of his career he seemed far more interested in conquering his fellow Muslims than fighting the Crusaders, he definitely was very interested in conquering all Crusader territory, and it was his stated goal to eliminate their presence in the Levant. Absolutely. And I would also point out, I think you know, when you analyze what, what the importance of jihad to Saladin, it's largely to keep his very diverse empire together. This was the common en enemy around which everyone could rally. Nevertheless, there were madrasas, there were imams who were even more fanatical than Saladin, and he was criticized by them and by their followers for not being forceful enough and not pressing the Christians harder, and as you say, for attacking his Muslims and even Sunni um, enemies sometimes more frequently and, and harder than he did the Christians. So I think, you know, it's fair to show these, these extremist elements, but you're absolutely right that Saladin himself was determined to wipe out the Christian kingdom. And we can say much the same for the Crusaders, who would run that gamut of religious fervor as well. 
whether it's from the kill them all, God will know his own statement that comes out of the Albigensian crusade, or the sort of more moderating attitudes of Raymond of Tripoli or the uh, historical Balian, where we as historians can differ is that level of fervor that we reasonably believe the evidence supports on either side. So in the next scene, we see Baldwin IV on his deathbed. The patriarch of Jerusalem, Heraclius, who Scott portrays as a sneering, wicked, cowardly old man, urges Baldwin to confess his sins. Baldwin tells the patriarch to, quote, spare me your sermons, and is very short and dismissive with this patriarch. He tells the patriarch that he will make his peace with God, not through a mere man. Again, pretty ahistorical. Baldwin IV was a devout Catholic. He would have taken final confession of his, of his sins to a priest fairly seriously. Also, Baldwin would not have considered the office of priesthood worthless and fraudulent as he appears to here. He would have valued the priesthood and its functions. Uh, Baldwin here is kind of talking more like a Martin Luther, you know, with this language about going directly to God without going through a priest. You're absolutely right, Steve. Baldwin IV would have been thinking very much about his soul at this stage and probably clinging to the priest who he trusted most, desperate not to die without absolution for his sin. That said, that priest probably would not have been Heraclius, because both contemporary sources for this period, William of Tyre and Arnold, attest to Heraclius' venial character and his lack of moral authority. He's allegedly the lover of Baldwin's mother, Agnes de Courtenay, who openly maintained the mistress. After Jerusalem surrendered and the citizens were required to pay a high ransom for their freedom, Heraclius aroused the outrage of Saladin and many of his English by leaving the city with wagons loaded full of riches, while poor were being marched off to slavery by the other gate. So Balian, by the way, and the Hospitallers, um, in contest, did all they could to ransom the poor. As I say, Heraclius was not known for being a particularly good uh, Christian or not a good example of Christian morality. And I think it's reasonable that Baldwin would not have wanted him as his confessor, but he would have wanted a confessor. Absolutely. And one thing we should keep in mind is that royal families often had a personal chaplain. It comes from the much older tradition of private patronage for churches. We think in our modern day very much of a community coming together and forming a church, but should remember that many of the earlier Franks, especially the Merovingian and Carolingian rulers who were rather famous for building monasteries and churches across France. The same would be true here where crusader leaders would have had a private confessor. Yes, and I absolutely agree with you, Helena, that Heraclius would have been the last priest in the kingdom that Baldwin would have been going for, for last rites. Anyway, so yeah, the following scene shows Baldwin IV still dying, now holding a meeting with Balian and Tiberius. Baldwin, who feels the end of his life approaching, is very eager to prevent Guy of Lusignan from taking power after his death. You see, Baldwin is terrified, as he says, that Guy might, quote, make war with the Muslims, which is a funny fear for a crusader king. But yeah, it wouldn't do for the politically correct Baldwin that's portrayed in this film. Of course, this is absurd. The real Baldwin IV spent the whole of his reign committed to the war against Islam. This isn't the real reason Baldwin wanted to prevent Guy from taking the throne, is it, Helena? No. It's not the reason Baldwin wanted to prevent Guy from becoming king, but it is true that Baldwin IV did everything in his power to try to assure he did not become king. He first crowned his nephew co-king during his own lifetime to ensure the succession. He then tried to persuade or force his sister to divorce Guy, and he finally made his barons and bishops swear that if his nephew died before he came of age, they would send to the kings of England and France, to the Holy Roman Emperor and the Pope, and let these, let, let these four leaders in the West decide who should be the next king of Jerusalem. Now to your question of why, it was pretty much the opposite of what is portrayed in the film. Baldwin IV feared that he would not be able to fight effectively against the Saracens because he did not command the respective barons of Jerusalem. Absolutely. Okay, so anyway, Baldwin and Tiberius ask Balian to join in a plot to murder Guy. Again, we know this plot is entirely ahistorical. And there probably isn't much more to say about it than that. Balian refuses to take part because he doesn't want to be a murderer. Okay, so Sibylla gets angry when she discovers Balian has refused the king's offer. She tells Balian, My grandfather took Jerusalem in blood. I'll keep it the same way. This, of course, isn't right. By grandfather, I'm assuming Sibylla means the father of her father, who was King Falk of Jerusalem 
who definitely was not involved in the First Crusade that captured Jerusalem. Correct. I think many of our viewers may be interested to know that this is Falk d'Anjou, was also the grandfather of Geoffrey d'Anjou, and so the grandfather of Henry II of England by his first wife. And that makes Geoffrey of Anjou a half-brother of Baldwin IV and Sibylla's father, Almeric, and made Henry II first cousin of Baldwin IV, Sibylla, and Isabella of Jerusalem. This explains the repeated appeals by Baldwin IV to him for aid, and Henry II's crusader vows and interest in the kingdom of Jerusalem. Yeah, it becomes a rather fascinating historical irony that Henry II is really never able to fulfill his crusader vows personally, but his son Richard I is one of, if not the preeminent leader of the Third Crusade. They were just petitioning the wrong Plantagenet. Up to a point, because actually they asked for Henry II's son, they asked Henry II to send one of his sons, and he denied John permission to go, and Richard, of course, wouldn't leave as long as his father was alive, because they were fighting each other. So Henry had to die before Richard was willing to go east. So we next get this scene that is rather touching. Sibylla goes to be with her brother, King Baldwin, as he is dying. Baldwin mentions that he had been dreaming about himself as a younger man, defeating Saladin in a great battle. I'm assuming he's talking about the Battle of Montgissard in 1177. This is followed by some somber shots of Baldwin's funeral, and then a great shot of the coronation of the young King Baldwin V. Okay, so next we go on to a scene where Balian is sitting around outside in the desert somewhere. The Hospitaller is there with him, and they exchange some brooding, vague dialogue. There is a part where Balian throws a rock, and it hits a little parched-looking bush and catches fire. Balian laughs and says, there's your religion, there's your Moses, but I did not hear the bush speak. For me, this scene is a rather cynical assault on history, and especially the sensibility of the age this movie is supposed to be depicting. And that's saying something, considering how frequently this movie distorts history for the sake of modern prejudices. Uh, Balian is basically mocking the story of Moses and the burning bush. Now, as you've mentioned, Helena, Balian was a devout Christian. The idea that he would mock this episode in the Bible as fraudulent is pretty absurd. The Bible and its contents were revered among 12th century Latins, and a knight like Balian would have treated them with respect. And furthermore, I think that Balian would not have had a problem with the fantastical stories in the Old Testament. This was an age when people took a concept like miracles pretty seriously. I agree. I'm, I'm sure that they revered the biblical stories and they believed that miracles had accompanied the first crusaders, which enabled them to win against the odds. A man like Balian would also, out of his profound piety, have been very reluctant to presume upon the grace of God. Truly devout men do not expect God to grant them miracles. They may pray for them, and they may pray that they will be worthy of them, but they do not presume that they will receive them. Yeah, that's a very good point on the division of faith. It goes back to the New Testament when Christ quotes the scriptures uh, saying, do not put the Lord thy God to the test. Uh, praying for something did not mean you expected to receive it. Certainly when calamity struck, there was the question of what did we do wrong that God is punishing us, uh, which speaks to the attempt to be worthy of the miracles they were praying for. But at the end of the day, even someone as pious as the historical Balian would have known that victory and defeat lay in his abilities guided by God. The historical yeah. Balian wouldn't be mocking God or stories from the Bible. So also during this same scene, the Hospitaller says that he's going to pray for what is to come. And Balian asks, what is to come? The Hospitaller answers rather moodily, the reckoning for what was done a hundred years before. The Muslims will never forget. Yeah, I mean, this is a ridiculous comment for a Hospitaller Knight to be making. First of all, the Crusaders did not view what had happened in the First Crusade as wrong. The taking of Jerusalem was remembered as a glorious triumph, and the defeat of the Muslims was regarded as God's just judgment. Secondly, this idea that the Muslims at this time were seething with a desire for revenge against the Crusaders, it's a little misleading. Certainly there was some sense of that among many Muslims. But it's interesting, the taking of Jerusalem in 1099 was also greeted with a certain amount of indifference among many in the Muslim world. Many Muslim emirs continued their own petty warfare with each other in the aftermath of the First Crusade. 
The capture of Jerusalem was certainly an offense against Islamic sensibilities, but the earliest Arab accounts of the taking of the city are the most laconic and don't stress any sense that there was an unusual amount of killing or slaughter when the holy city fell. And I'm thinking about like, for example, Ibn al kalanisi so I, I think he's the earliest uh, Arab chronicler we have of the taking of Jerusalem, and his mention of it is so brief. Over time, the numbers seem to have gotten inflated, and by later chroniclers, such as those written in the 13th century, Muslim authors seem to depict the taking of Jerusalem in a more heinous, ultra-violent light as a crime that demanded uh, some sort of response. I mean, the bottom line is the rules of war for since warfare since the age of Troy call that for a city that is taken by storm to be put to the sword. The Christians did it at Jerusalem, and the Muslims did it at Edessa and Antioch, and later at one Christian city after another. Absolutely. It was common, it was common practice to put a city's populace to the sword. Uh, these are brutal tactics by our estimation, but they ensured that when your knights and armies were out suppressing the countryside, that the people wouldn't just lock the gates behind you after overpowering the garrison, forcing you to lay siege to the same city over again. Fear kept the people in line in the short term, and in the long term that would be replaced with peace if all went well. If cities surrendered, of course, there was a good chance of being spared. Peasants learned this in more volatile area, areas in eras such as the Hundred Years' War or even later with the Italian Wars. When an army is beaten and decimated, the city gates would be thrown open and they'd uh, welcome the conquerors with open arms. When those conquerors were beaten later on, they'd throw the gates open and welcome back their former rulers. As I stated <laughs> in an earlier episode, peace was where a, pe a peasant's ultimate loyalty resided. And it was the job of a king to make use of all the tools available to change that loyalty from peace to a given crown and family. Right. Very interesting. Okay. Well, that brings us to the end of this episode. Uh, again, I want to thank both of you for being here. Helena, thanks so much for being with us. Uh, if you wouldn't mind, go ahead and uh, let everybody know where they can find out about your work and your writing. I've got two websites. One is HelenaPSchrader.com, which is about all my books, and the one that's probably more the website that's probably more interesting to the viewers of this of Real Crusades history is called um, DefenderOfJerusalem.com, and it covers the Kingdom of Jerusalem and Bailey and the Evil in particular. All right, great, and Paul, I want to say thanks to you as well. We really appreciate having you here. I'm more than happy to be here, and uh, I'm very glad to be a part of this whole endeavor. Great. So looks like we've got a couple more episodes left. Um, we'll be back next week, next Monday. You can check out uh, the channel, and you will find part five of our review of Kingdom of Heaven closing in on the end of the movie. So thanks very much for listening. Uh, please check us out at realcrusadeshistory.com, and we'll see you next time.